Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dark Parade. This is episode one, which feels like a crazy thing to say for anything I do, but this is episode one of the, the actual show, which will be dropping every Ding Dong Wednesday. Uh, I'm very excited to, first of all, kick off the show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of this. And second of all, to do things in a slightly different format and explore things that I haven't explored before. So I'm very excited. I hope uh, you come along with me on this journey. Um, Right out of the gate, I wanted to do a series that was kind of classic, but something I wasn't entirely familiar with. And as of this recording, I still haven't seen uh, Psycho 4. But uh, yeah, we're doing the Psycho movie, starting with the original Psycho. And like I said, I want to do things in a slightly different format so that it's not just a, this scene-by-scene recap of uh, a movie and then a review. I want to get a little deeper into it. That That's kind of my bag, is to explore uh, the, the subtext of films a little bit more. And I was really lucky to have Mr. Venom, a.k.a. Jerry Cortez, along for the ride on this one because he is a student of Hitchcock. Uh, We do take a little longer than even I expected with the plot, but that's because we kept pausing to talk about things within the scene that uh, Hitchcock placed there as symbolism or to continue uh, his his thematic ideas in the film. And so uh, that part of it uh, in in future episodes probably not going to be as long, but I don't want to reduce a second of what we talked about because it was all really valuable. It wasn't just, hey, here's what happens. It was, hey, by the way, did you see this bird on the wall? And did you see these shadows? And uh, it, it's really good. Like, if you haven't seen Psycho in a long time or if you've never seen it, I think this show actually serves as a great companion piece uh, to watching the film. We throw in a lot of trivia, a lot of making of kind of stuff along the way. Uh, He and I are both working off of the Universal 4 Blu-ray set of Psycho 1 through 4, and I think both of us would recommend that. It's a a really nice package. I think I picked it up for about 30 bucks, so it's not going to break the bank if you want to uh, complete your uh, Psycho film collection. So that's it for me for now. I'll be back on the back end of this, but let's waste no more time and get right into it. Here's Jerry and I talking about Psycho, and I really think you're going to like it. Hey, everyone. So, uh, first of all, let me welcome to episode one, which is a weird thing to say about any show I do. Um, but this is episode one of The Dark Parade featuring um, the the one, the only, Mr. Venom, a.k.a. Jerry Cortez from uh, No More Room in Hell. Um, and what else? What am I forgetting? What you do like a million things like me. Oh God. Yeah. Um, technically there's three shows under the no more room in hell banner. Uh, the main show, of course, no more room in hell. Then we have the weekly show fresh cuts where we look at just the, the newest releases. And then I just started the next side cast, which is called creature comforts, which is going to be specifically uh, creature feature based. So uh, Don Anelli, Derek B from Cinema Attack and myself are all big creature feature fans. So we decided to do that as well. Episode one is currently available where we look at 1933's King Kong. And um, as far as my other shows go, we've got In the Mic of Madness with the lovely Rebecca Reinhardt. Uh, it's Not Horror, Okay, my kind of comedy commentary uh, podcast that I do with the guys from NFW and the Friday Nightmares podcast. Uh, basically, just a bunch of goofballs getting together and doing some commentaries on very off-the-beaten-path movies. Our most recent episode was 1986's Thunder Run, which is a very obscure action movie from 1986. Uh, it's a weird one that I had never heard of, but yeah. Um, and also then- my favorite uh, Garth Brooks song. Oh, very nice. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see what else do I have. And then uh, the only Legion podcast that I have, all those podcasts that I talked about are all available on the Dark Discussions podcast network, darkdiscussions.com. Uh, the Legion podcast uh, that I'm on is Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space with the incomparable Jerry Herring from Kill the Cast. Uh, that is, of course, our uh, Kaiju and all things Japanese monster podcast. And even some other countries, we've touched on Korea, the, the UK, uh, 
uh, other places like that. So yeah, everything kaiju and giant monster is on underwater kaiju from outer space. And I've even got a couple of others that are in the process of being created, but um, still waiting on uh, some assets for that. So I won't make any announcements yet. But yeah, as you can tell, I'm an absolute podcasting whore. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> we, yeah, we've had this discussion offline that both of us are just like, look, I've got way too much free time on my hands. Uh, and, exactly. and when that happens, that means that I'm going to get in front of a microphone and, and say something. So um, the first series uh, in the Dark Parade is going to be uh, the, the Psycho series of films. And this actually came about because I was doing the, the 31 Days of Halloween uh, for Legion on the legionpodcast.com uh as you are listening to this every every ding dong day uh of october uh, i've got a little mini review of a movie and the first thing i did was psycho because i hadn't seen it in forever and ever and uh, i really enjoyed psycho of course going back and revisiting it and it really made me want to explore that movie in a little bit more detail as well as the other films in the series and as it so happens, you and I have the same, I assume it's the same universal Blu-ray set. Yeah, the box set, yeah, yeah. with all four of them, yep. So, in a weird way, this is going to be both a discussion of Psycho and probably some of that box set. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, which which I, I find to be somewhat uneven in its offerings, but we'll get to that. Uh, so, uh, first of all, as we talk about Psycho... We're just going to uh, talk about the story first, which is maybe the greatest head fake of cinema history. <laughs> and, Easily. Yeah. It, it, and it's... Look, I years ago, I wrote a movie called Lost After Dark. And I did the psycho in that. Of, and, and I'm not the first to rip it off. <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> not even the most recent to rip it off uh but it's such a great narrative trick of presenting a character in the case of psycho it's marion crane and marion crane is a woman who is in the midst of an illicit affair with her lover sam um and and i think if you're gonna have an illicit lover have a sam (laughs) (laughs) but anyway she she is a fairly decent person at heart and 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 as we meet them uh, she's basically saying like i don't want to live like this anymore i don't want to be the kept woman i don't want to be the woman i don't want to be the side piece uh she says uh <laughs> <laughs> paraphrasing in 1960s terms i think the, the way she puts it is like i want i want i want to be able to cook a, a steaks with my sister with my mother's uh portrait on the mantle <laughs> and um and and then sam being a dude uh says uh well what about after huh what about what about after the steak and uh she's like yeah yeah, yeah we'll turn the picture around and you know do some fucking <laughs> uh but yeah so she you know he doesn't want to leave his current situation he doesn't have a whole lot of money that kind of thing and as as fate would have it she works uh, for a real estate guy and this <laughs> kind of uh, loud and abrasive, uh, I assume, Texan. I don't know if he's really from Texas, but that's what mm. I assume. Uh, it's probably a safe bet since they are in Phoenix. Yeah. And so he's got 40 grand in cash and uh, basically hands it to her, or, you know, it, it, it's directed to her to deposit in the bank uh there's a real estate deal going down that sounds a little fishy (laughs) but not like not necessarily criminal but certainly like hey i'm trying to dodge some taxes (laughs) through this (laughs) (laughs) and he has some line about declaring money like i don't declare uh or or, no uh, somebody says oh forty thousand dollars i do declare and and he says well i don't that's why i don't pay taxes (laughs) uh uh, God bless you, Texas. <laughs> I love the line about I never carry any more than I can afford to lose. And he's walking around with 40 grand in cash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And 
he's got a, another great line in this scene. Uh, I really enjoy where he says uh, to uh, Marion Crane, uh, he says, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy a lack of unhappiness. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's a terrific line. Yep. You know? um, but yeah, so there is, there's the temptation, right? Is, hey, here's $40,000, Marion Crane, um, has a moment of weakness and so decides she's going to take this money and just kind of hit the road and take the money to Sam and thereby, I, you know, I mean, it's real spur of the moment. It's not like she has, is planning a heist. It's just she has this moment where she's like, I've got all this money. Maybe we can make a new life, life for ourselves somewhere. But it's kind of a terrible idea. No, it really is. No forethought whatsoever. Yeah, she's a really shitty criminal, but all the criminals in this are kind of shitty, which is one of the yeah. things I like about it. Uh, Norman Bates is no better. He is he is not a mastermind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Norman Bates is only ever so slightly a better liar than Marion. <laughs> yes, ever so slightly. Yeah. And and yeah, so she she hits the road, and I think maybe my favorite scenes watching this movie again and knowing all the tricks of it and so forth are the scenes where the cop kind of grills her uh, mm-hmm. when she, like she she's heading out of town and she just drives to the point where she's got to pull over and get some rest and so a cop finds her the next day asleep in her car and he, he kind of hassles her a little bit and is vaguely suspicious because again Marion Crane is one of the world's worst criminals and as soon as she he says good morning She's like, I didn't steal any money. It's so crazy that you would say that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is so obvious that Marion Crane is incredibly lily white in this movie. I mean, she's obviously not a master criminal. And as soon as the police officer starts talking to her, she cops an attitude instantly. And it's like, wow. So so obviously she doesn't even have any experience dealing with police officers. That's how, you know squeaky clean this woman is so yeah it's uh it's almost painful to watch at times you know it, you know living in this day and age knowing that you know how we have to kind of act when we're around police officers to not antagonize them and then to watch this uh you know uh, woman who obviously has is, has just had a squeaky clean sheltered life uh giving this man attitude like he doesn't have the right to take you in if he wants to uh sheer balls absolutely yeah <laughs> and but he does let her go mm-hmm. but then it seems like she she's being followed by this cop and it, it's a, a really nice tense scene where she's kind of checking the rear view and then he seems to peel away and marion crane decides hey i'm gonna be a super criminal <laughs> and hide my tracks by going to this used car lot and i'm gonna buy another car i'm gonna trade my car in and get a new a new car and then lo and behold it's just like i have uh erased the events of the past 24 hours and i can now continue my criminal enterprise um only once again as you said completely out of her depth Mm -hmm. uh is basically harassing the salesman (laughs) into giving her a car without taking it for a test drive or nothing and and then sure enough, the cop that was Hasslayer shows up across the street and is eyeballing her pretty hard, and it it just it sends her into a tizzy. And I really love it because I you know part of it is the score, but also Janet Lee is just giving a great performance here, where she's uh, she's real manic, and it's it's great. Like it's uncomfortable to watch, but that's what makes it wonderful. Is you're like oh you were fucking this up so bad. <laughs> Absolutely. Once again, just, uh, I, I, I question how much experience she has buying a car. I mean, yeah, right. she, she asks the salesman, is it, am I doing something wrong? Is it illegal to buy a car cash? And it's like, well, no, of course it's not illegal, but since so few people do it, it's gonna light some, you know, some red flags. And, that's why the cop continues to follow her because she's a terrible liar. It's very obvious when he speaks to her on the road that she's done something wrong. Uh, she's obviously either running away from someone or something. Um, 
so obviously the cop is going to follow her. And then when she gets the used car lot and starts this whole thing with, I just want to buy the car here, take my registration, take my $700 plus my trade and and just give me the car. And then she has the unmitigated gall to get mad at the salesman because of this. And it's like, honey, it, it's it, it's almost his job to kind of question why you want to buy this car so badly. You know, I mean, I, I just can't imagine the mentality of something of someone wanting to just buy a car on the spot, sight unseen and, you know, no test drive, no nothing. Just take my trade in and go. It, it, she might as well wear a T-shirt saying I'm hiding something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's just it, uh, yeah, it, uh, just once again, going back to her lack of experience with uh, the criminal world. <laughs> and he even says to her. You know, like, look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with buying a car with cash. I'm saying it's weird that you don't want to test drive it and you're in such a hurry that you just want to get the hell out of here as fast as you can. Are you mm-hmm. running from something? And she's like, no, that's so crazy. Why would you say that? Why would I be running from anything? And it it is just the most suspicious behavior in the history of suspicious behavior. Like, if mm-hmm. I briefly at one time in my life worked on a car lot uh selling cars and that was my job i didn't actually sell cars um i was not very good at the job most of the time i just watched uh the godfather in uh in the back of one of the suvs that had a dvd player built into it good choice yeah well you know uh, you gotta pick your battles oh yeah and i mean i didn't know anything about engines what am i gonna tell somebody trying to buy a car i mean that's yeah. foolish <laughs> they, they, they're way better off de- talking to somebody else um yep. <laughs> but but even a, as poor a car salesman as i was if somebody came in and was like i need to trade this car in here's five thousand dollars in cash and i need to be off this lot in 10 minutes then i would be like oh you're a drug dealer got it <laughs> you're you are moving narcotics and or uh human beings <laughs> across state lines and i want no part of this uh, but yeah, so she ends up haranguing this guy into selling her the car and swapping the plates. And then she leaves her suitcase and coat in the old car because she she's in such a hurry to get the fuck out of there. That they're like, hey, don't you want your stuff, your life in this bag? And she's like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, throw it in the back. I got to get out of here. Yeah, I was actually surprised the cop didn't stop her at that point. The fact that she's leaving without her suitcase and coat, she's in, obviously in a very much in a, a gigantic hurry. Uh, I'm I'm shocked that the the cop let her drive off the lot. I mean, if I were that cop, I would have stopped her and said, "All right, listen, uh, you, you got to come clean. There's obviously something wrong. You're not coming clean with me. If you don't give me a viable story right now, I'm taking you in." Or at the very least, I'm searching your car and your property. And of course, that would have been the end of that. So I just can't believe that cop let her go with all the suspicious activity that she was partaking in. Yeah, it's really crazy. Like the slightest bit of pressure from this cop and she would have folded like a cheap table. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But but instead, she does, in fact, get out, get off the car lot and is hitting the road. Uh, she's driving through the night. Uh, it, out, out of nowhere comes a big rainstorm. And sure enough, she ends up at the Bates Motel. <laughs> and uh, this is where... Okay. So she uh, meets Norman Bates here for the first time, who seems uh, charming enough, if a little awkward, mm-hmm. I would say. And uh, they have this very, you know... Not it's not a flirty conversation, but it's a friendly conversation about. Oh, do you have a place for rent? Oh, well, you know, twelve, twelve cabins, twelve vacancies. Uh, you know, any anyone you want. Uh-huh. And uh, so he very kindly offers her uh, cabin number one, and uh, and that's kind of the moment because you see his hand hesitate uh-huh. before he hands her a key, and there's a moment where. It's almost like, well, I'm going to give you the key that's just going to let you have a good night's rest and then you're going to go about your business. <laughs> but then he hands her the key to room number one. And that means, for all intents and purposes, she's a dead woman walking mm-hmm. at this point. But uh, she, of course, doesn't know that at this point. She uh, is going about all the business of 
uh, hiding the money. She has hidden all this, uh, the remaining money in a newspaper. Um, <laughs> which... Something else that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, I, she's just terrible. She's such a terrible <laughs> criminal. And, and he kind of strong arms her into having some dinner with him. Which mm-hmm. they do in uh, this parlor surrounded by stuffed birds. Mm. Oh, the symbolism. So thick in this scene. Yeah. Uh, Marion Crane <laughs> surrounded uh. by stuffed birds. And then the birds themselves, too. I mean, I could I could probably talk for an hour on the symbolism on the birds, but just uh, just when you see her sit down, there's a songbird right next to her. Uh, whereas when we look at Norman and he's in a good mood, we see uh, more songbirds, like uh, like game hens type birds, on the, um, the pedestal next to him. But then as soon as he gets agitated, the camera angle changes it changes to a low angle, and then we see birds of prey in attack positions above him. Yeah, I, I just, this, this filmmaking is brilliant. I mean, I could talk about Hitchcock for days, but man, let's move on before I get stuck on a, a discussion on the symbolisms of the birds in this movie, because I could probably take up an hour just on that. Did you happen to watch the uh, the bit on, on the extras that was the Truffaut-Hitchcock conversation? Yes. <laughs> and and he mentions that too. He he doesn't get deep into it, but he does mention the birds and it's it's mm-hmm. just one of those things to your point. There is no accident in no. any shot in this film. You Not know? a one. Yeah, this this is like I mean Hitchcock is like a Kubrick. Yeah. I mean, he he micromanages every single shot and that's, you know, part of his genius, of course. Yeah. And and so this is the other big revelation scene for me when I came back to this movie after a number of years away from it mm-hmm. is how damn good Ugh. this scene in the parlor is. It is, mm-hmm. it's so, it, like, it's revealing. Uh, each of these characters reveals things about themselves, and you start to understand that Norman Bates is probably not just the happy go lucky, charming guy who's a uh-huh. bit put upon by his mother, that there is something really sinister about Norman Bates here. Yeah, I mean, right from the very start of the conversation where he, where he tells her, you know, you eat like a bird, it's very obvious that Norman looks at women as, you know, decorative songbirds, you know, not, not birds of prey at, in any way, shape, or form. And just the expressions on his face combined with the different angles depending on his mood... It, it, it's I mean, if you're really, really paying attention and I would never fault anyone for missing this. But if you're really paying attention, Norman's hate of women really shines through in this scene just based on the cinematography, uh, his facial expressions, his vocal tone, all of it. You know, at no point does he flat out say I have an issue with women. But if you're really, really paying attention, it's all over this scene. Oh, for sure. And especially when she dares suggest, because Norman starts talking about his mother and caring for her and that she's not well. Um, And Marion Crane makes the mistake of saying, you know, you could get out of this. You could put her in a, and he's like, what, in a home, in an institution? And he gets borderline belligerent with her about this, of, of how dare you suggest something like this, you know? A boy's best friend is his mother, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and um and and this is where he has the the very classic line, uh, you know, she just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little <laughs> mad sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And you know, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but uh this is <laughs> such a showcase for Anthony Perkins just to take this character uh-huh. for a walk and and he is up to every bit of it absolutely uh, but so there's uh this this great exchange but also uh you know as he's talking about why he can't leave his mother and how uh we we create traps for ourselves is how he puts it <laughs> and yeah and and uh, that, yeah go that kind of lead i was gonna say that kind of leads back to even his name uh, the, the, the word bait uh, here, I wrote it down here somewhere. Uh, the word bait actually means for a bird of prey, like a hawk to flutter his wings for the first time to try to escape the nest. 
even more symbolism there. Um, he, you know, Norman's living under the thumb of his mother. He's unable to get away from her shadow. Also, if you notice in this scene how the birds of prey cast long shadows as opposed to the songbirds casting short shadows. Just, again, more incredible symbolism from Hitchcock. But, ah, oh God, this scene. This, I mean, yeah, this may be my favorite scene in the film, in all honesty. As yeah. dark and twisted a person as I may be, this scene is pure magic. It's absolute gold. I I just adore it. I could watch it on a on a loop. <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I like I in going back and doing some research and going through the extras <laughs> and everything, it was always this scene that I kept returning to and thinking like this is the scene that gives you everything you need to know about Norman Bates. It also has that turn where you see Marion Crane realize, oh, I fucked up. You know, <laughs> like, I, I can't get away with this. I'm never going to get away with this because I'm a terrible criminal. Yep. Uh, and she has, she's self-aware enough to know that. And then decides that she's going to go back to uh, Phoenix and and just you know face the consequences face the music and whatever happens happens uh-huh. um and and it's also where i i don't even remember the name she puts in the book but it's where she kind of reveals that oh my yeah. name isn't whatever from los angeles it's marion crane from phoenix and yeah she signed in as marie samuels that's right yeah yeah basically uh the first name being a form of her first name and then samuels because she's dating a guy named sam so, kind right. of a terrible alias, but whatever. Again, it just goes to show Marion is not a uh, career criminal. <laughs> right. Yeah, she's, as we continue to say, <laughs> yeah. one of the world's worst criminals ever on screen. Um, and mm-hmm. yeah, and so, you know, I when I watched this, and this was something I said when I did the 31 Days of Halloween thing. When I watched this again, I tried to put myself in the shoes of someone in 1960 who didn't know anything about this movie other than Anthony Perkins and Janet Lee were in it. Both of whom were big stars. Yeah, Janet Lee was a gigantic star. Huge get for Hitchcock. Yeah, yeah. And especially for a movie of this budget, which yeah. was under a million dollars, which, I mean, even in 1960 was nothing. Oh, yeah. I love the stories of how he used... Uh, the film crew from the Alfred Hitchcock presents TV show to kind of minimize cost on this. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, this was one of the stories they tell on the, on the making of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically Hitchcock was looking around at the landscape of cinema. This is the guy who had just done, uh, you know, North by Northwest and, um, vertigo. Like those are the movies in his immediate rear view which are both brilliant films. Vertigo in particular is, you know, oh, yeah. that's taught in film school for a very good reason. Mm-hmm. And he decided, Hey, all these people making low budget movies that are just doing gangbusters at the box office. What if a really good director did one like <laughs> me and then did and it became, you know, to his credit, he was smart enough to realize what he was doing because it was the most successful movie financially that he ever made. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, I, I just love that kind of thing of like, hey, what if I did one of these cheap little thrillers <laughs> and just, I don't know, made one of the greatest movies of all time? Yep. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we have two of the biggest stars, uh, more so Janet Lee than anthony perkins but anthony perkins was a very well-known actor and could mm-hmm. star in a movie all on his own and we have this great scene between them she ends up heading back to her room and- oh and don't forget i i wanted to mention too uh once again if you're really really paying attention to the scene in the parlor uh marion's death is foreshadowed uh, i mentioned earlier that when she's sitting on the couch uh there are songbirds next to her as soon as she stands up, what's the bird behind her? It is a crow. What do crows represent? Death. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. It's, uh, right. It's, again, it, it, you know, there's a lot of shadow play as well. 
Oh, uh, the, sh- the light and shadow yeah. usage in this movie. Absolutely stellar. You know, and that's one of those like film student things. But if you're like, if listeners want to just wallow in film nerd uh, <laughs> kind of culture, just watch Psycho again with birds and shadows in mind. And yep. every scene is going to have something for you to chew on. I mean, even the opening credits have symbolism. If you, if you really pay attention to the opening credits, you see the use of the bars going across the screen. Hitchcock uses that because bars in film represents captivity. You know, yeah. You're standing behind bars. And then if you, uh, as you're watching the credits, when the stars' names come across the screen, they split in half. Rep- uh, that, that's Hitchcock, Hitchcock's way of telling the audience, uh, A, you're trapped in the theater. That's what the bars are for. Uh, you're at my mercy. And then also no one in this film is safe because every single actor's name breaks in half uh, during the beginning. Uh, that was you know Hitchcock's represent- representation of death, if you will. Yeah. Uh, the name's kind of breaking in half. So, yeah, I mean, even in the opening credits, there's symbolism. It's ridiculous. And, and let me just say this, listeners. You are so lucky that Jerry is here. <laughs> uh, folks, I am a Hitchcock aficionado. I uh, I reviewed Rope, which is, uh, 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 just if anyone's uh, curious, Rope is actually my favorite Hitchcock movie ever. Uh, I got a chance to review that last year on Cut to the Chase, and we did a three-hour epic review where I broke down just all the all the symbolism, the themes, the themes of homosexu- homosexuality, classism, everything else. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely adore Rope. Even though it's not really one continuous shot, there's actually six cuts in the movie. The fact that it's put together in a way that it looks like it's one continuous shot is just so brilliant to me. Ugh. Yeah, I I really love, yeah, Rope is fantastic. I'm a real mm-hmm. window guy. Nice, I just, nice. I, that is my Hitchcock film. Uh, that's the one that, I, I'm a big Jimmy Stewart fan. And I mean, he's great at mm-hmm. Rope as well, but oh, yeah. uh, there's something about the, the, the structure of Rear Window Mm-hmm. that I absolutely adore and uh, yeah I just can't get enough of it but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that the shot that goes from the uh, Jimmy Stewart's busted leg to the busted camera oh yes to the picture of the race car flipping over and it tells <laughs> the whole story of like here's what happened mm-hmm. it's so good it's one of those like Hitchcock moments of like you like this guy was just born to direct films oh, yeah. in, in a way that like Kubrick was like the, your, his mind was made for doing this and, mm-hmm. and doing it at the highest of levels. But anyway, so <laughs> yes. So we, we go uh, from the parlor to Marion Crane goes back to her room where she um, is, like at this point, she's fully resolved. Hey, I'm going to uh, turn myself in and, and, you know, whatever comes of it is what comes of it. She's got her little piece of paper that uh, she jots down. Hey, here's how much money I started with. Again, not a great criminal because this is not, yeah, this is like uh, um, a, a Stringer Bell saying, are you taking notes on a goddamn criminal conspiracy? Like it's <laughs> that level of like, why are, this is evidence against you. Don't yep. do this. But she uh yeah she like subtracts like oh i had like you know two dollars for lunch at the deli and then (laughs) i bought the car that i forced that guy to sell me and and so she's going to go back with the rest of the money and presumably kind of throw herself at at the mercy of her boss and this other guy and perhaps like make some arrangement to pay the money back and who knows you know she could go to jail she could it could all work out regardless she's she's not going to be on the run anymore Mm -hmm. And did you, I'm not sure if you noticed, but did you notice how the lighting on Marion changes before and after she makes that decision to go back to Phoenix? Like when she's in the when she's in uh, cabin number one, hiding the money, she's casting very dark, broad shadows throughout the room. But then after that scene, after she has her sandwich and she makes the, basically makes the decision that I'm going to go back to Phoenix and face the music. 
suddenly she's not casting as hard of a shadow and she's much more brightly lit in the cabin right before she jumps in the shower. Just another tiny little Hitchcock touch that's just, again, most 95% of people probably won't even notice it. I might even go as high as 99% of the viewers won't notice it. But if you're really paying attention, uh, it's such a, it, it, it almost makes you think that Marion is safe. You know, she's made yeah. this decision to go back. Now she's lit brighter. She's not casting shadows. So it's almost like a hopeful scene, if you will, uh, until she turns on the water. <laughs> yeah. And, and to that point, there's that earlier scene uh, with her and Sam in the hotel. Where, mm-hmm, when she's wearing all white. Yeah. yeah. And and they're also talking about their illicit affair and so forth. And as mm-hmm. soon as she starts talking about like, hey, I want you to come over and meet my sister and and be a real relationship sam pulls the blinds up yep. and and actual sunlight comes streaming in instead of the filtered sunlight through the, the blinds mm. uh it's a little stuff like that where again you're like well hitchcock is just the best that ever was um <laughs> but yeah so she she gets in the shower and this is of course the iconic um shower scene um probably my favorite thing about this in in the research that i did and and watching all those extras Mm -hmm. was that scorsese ripped off uh the shower scene for the raging bull sequence where jake lamotta gets pummeled right um (laughs) like shot for shot it's just instead of a knife it's boxing gloves Mm -hmm. and that was one of those things that i never considered before but is it's so obvious now that the scales have fallen away from my eyes i'm like oh <laughs> of course of course that's what that is but yeah it's uh it, it, you know i don't i mean what what do you say about one of the most famous sequences in the history of movies i mean the editing in this scene is absolutely stellar it, it's literally one of the best edited minute and a half of a, a movie i think i've ever seen um between the the use of the music which by the way i you know, i'm sure you know this already but the fact that hitchcock didn't want to put a score on that scene seems insane i actually watched yeah. a youtube video where uh they actually showed the scene without the score and i will admit it is still very effective without the score because you can hear the stabs a lot louder and things like that the the rushing water is uh definitely more present in the in the soundtrack but it's it's just a half a step behind what we actually get that score um you know the shrill high pitch strings just puts it so over the top um it's literally one of the greatest scenes of horror or uh, you know suspense ever yeah there's the great story that uh is it his daughter that tells the story about when they were taking this to um the censors mm. and in, at the at the time it was uh paramount sky and he watched the movie he was like we can't take this to the the mpaa because there's breasts in it and they're like, no, 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 run it back. You show me where there's a breast in this. Yep. And and it's the same kind of thing that like every every figurative cut of the of the edit is a slash of the knife, and yeah. it shows very little, but it there's it's incredibly impactful. It's the reason that people stop taking showers yeah. for half a century. <laughs> there you go. I mean, this movie is. Or excuse me. This scene is uh, just man uh, i'm having trouble putting the words together here um just the the way that he puts it together um and and even the way oh and that's that's the point i was trying to make is that this is a very realistic death scene too i don't want to get too morbid here but i really really hate in movies when someone gets stabbed and they just fall over dead you know we see it all the time here marion is stabbed eight total times if you count she's stabbed eight times but she doesn't die right away she doesn't even fall right away like norman or you know mom leaves the bathroom she's still partially on her feet then she falls down uh, on her butt she's sitting in the in the shower then she pulls at the shower curtain and brings it down as she falls and takes her final breath. It is, I could see how this scene would be incredibly disturbing in 1960, even without the blood, without the nudity. Um, 
it, it's just ridiculous. And then uh, back to my original point, this movie, this scene, uh, once again, is purposely edited to make the viewer think that you're seeing more than you're actually seeing. It's, it's kind of like uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre analogy that I always use. Uh, the girl getting hung up on the hook. You, you could talk to people and they'll tell you, oh, that scene where she's, you know, put on the hook and you see the hook go into her. It's so, uh, you know, gory. And it's like, well, wait a minute. We don't see the hook go into her. What are you talking about? And they're like, yes, I guess you do. I'll bet you any amount of money. Once again, the scene is edited in a way to make the viewer think they're seeing more than they actually are. Their brain is basically filling in what we think should be there. That's why people think there's breasts, like bare breasts in the shower scene. And that's why people think you can actually see the knife going into her. There is not one single shot of the knife actually puncturing her flesh. But if you talk to half the people that have seen this movie, they'll vehemently say, no, you absolutely see that. And that's just, once again, the brilliance of Hitchcock's editing. Yeah. Yeah, and really you just see all these quick flashes and then as you said she kind of pulls down the cam uh, not camera the the cur- the shower curtains mm-hmm. and then you start to see the chocolate syrup for blood uh swirl around <laughs> the drain mm-hmm. and that and that's kind of it like if you if you describe it it sounds like it it's pedestrian and yep. even today when you watch it it's still really visceral Oh yeah, and and like you said, the music goes a long way. It's you know the, a score that is nothing but strings. There is no <laughs> percussion, no piano, no woodlands, yeah. nothing, just stringed instruments, and it is haunting. And in this moment, it is especially uh, like it's this, and then at the end where it's used, this kind of shrieking, <laughs> where uh, you, you feel like the the strings are coming to get you (laughs) you know this this is almost migraine inducing level of of high-pitched shrieking and but it's a brilliant you know they say that the the violin is the closest to the human voice and and Mm -hmm. it like the shrieking violins here are you know it is it is the audience and marion collectively shrieking yep absolutely oh it's so good and so yeah uh the you see the killer run out. Marion Crane collapses to the the floor of the bathroom, dead. We get the very very good shot of her open eye mm-hmm. uh, as the camera pulls away from it, and uh, and then Norman, uh, you know, check it to see how things are going. <laughs> discovers that uh, his mother has uh, has killed yet another woman uh and shrieks you know my god the blood the blood <laughs> um and and has to clean up his mother's mess yeah uh which is another terrific scene where we see him very casually throw this $40,000 uh you know less sandwiches and a car um <laughs> into the trunk along with the body and we realize at this point like oh that money didn't matter at all that was that was a complete red herring you know the the MacGuffin of the film <laughs> is, is this money and Marion Crane's thievery like that the, the story is immediately handed off to Norman Bates mm-hmm. and becomes his film and um which is a, it was a huge deal in 1960 I mean considering how big a star Janet Lee was you know, th- this was Drew Barrymore in the opening scene of Scream just 50 years earlier. You know, uh, just uh, it's such a shock to the audience to see the main star, if you will, taken out in what, uh, about the one hour mark or so. So, yeah, just so heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, about halfway through the movie, all of a sudden, the character that you have been following the entire time is now gone. Um, just a terrific trick. Mm-hmm. And then the movie sort of becomes this different film about Norman Bates, you know, shoving this car into a mud <laughs> pit. And uh, then a it's Marion's sister who then comes looking for her, uh, played by Vera Miles. Mm-hmm. And so she follows 
the the path to Sam, who works in a hardware store, uh, conveniently surrounded by rakes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because we need more symbolism there and, you go. <laughs> uh, and claws and talons and whatnot mm-hmm. <clears throat> and she basically confronts him and accuses him of being in some kind of uh, ha- having some kind of plan with her sister Marion and he's like I don't know in, in a convincing turn Sam acts like he doesn't know what the hell's going on <laughs> He's like, I don't know what you're talking about, lady. I don't. I haven't seen her, you know, since I, I left town. Since I left Phoenix. <laughs> What's funny is that as innocent as Sam actually is in this film, ultimately I blame him for all the events in this movie. If he would have married Marion earlier, none of this would have happened. Yeah. I, I just I, I I hate looking at it this way because ultimately Sam kind of is an innocent bystander but if he's been if they've been you know having this little you know secret affair it's not even an affair really because sam is divorced and she's single it's just you know premarital you know sex in 1960s probably frowned upon so um all she really wanted was to make the relationship legitimate that was it uh, you know she didn't want any of his money she didn't she didn't care about the fact that he was still paying alimony or having to pay back whatever a loan for the sh- for the store whatever the case may be but it's like if he would have just married her even a, a month earlier <laughs> poor marion crane would have survived well into old age <laughs> yes yes if he could have gotten off his high horse about like mm-hmm. well i just live in the back of a hardware store i can't you know how how am i ever gonna support you it's like ah, <laughs> get over yourself you know you're lucky you're lucky to have a woman like this who loves you and uh, who has a job? I mean, you yeah. know, second income in 1960 is huge. Right. <laughs> you know, be a couple of, uh, uh, what it was, the no kids, double income. There you go. That, you know? That's what, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> double income, no kids. <laughs> right. Be proud of it. Uh, anyway. Damn right. <laughs> so he ends up uh, convincing her pretty much, like, because he doesn't know anything that she can kind of buy that he doesn't know anything but enter my other favorite character of this movie which is the detective played by martin balsam yes awesome (laughs) yeah he is uh arbogast is his name Mm -hmm. and he's like hey uh this crazy texan hired me to find out what the hell was going on with his money (laughs) and i tracked uh that money to you two knuckleheads and so I want to know, you know, where she is. Like, And they've been calling around to various hotels and motels in the area, trying to find anyone that's seen hiding her hair mm-hmm. of Marion Crane. And Arbogast uh, decides he's going to go uh, do a little footwork of his own, which ultimately leads him to Norman Bates and the Bates Motel. And... Their conversation is great because Norman Bates is also not a great criminal. <laughs> oh, man. I, he, he, this is another scene where I'm watching it like you might as well just wear a T-shirt that says I killed her. I, he's such a terrible liar. Every time that uh, Arborgast kind of calls him on something that's not true, like, oh, well, you said no one's been here in two weeks, but now you're saying a couple, you know, stopped by last week and they almost missed it because the sign was off. And you can see literally Norman stumble, literally, if not figuratively, stumble on his words to to be like, oh, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just forgot about it. I mean, just what a t- you would think that as crazy ass Norman has probably had some kind of practice with lying, with covering up his deeds, but apparently not, because <laughs> he's just terrible here. Yeah, well, I don't think he's ever been actually questioned for the, any mm-hmm. of these crimes. Like, presumably, the other women that we find out have gone missing in in the area um, are, you know, were never reported or certainly never investigated the way that Marion's disappearance has been. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Arbogast uh, has his antenna up about Bates and his squirrely uh, <laughs> non-confession. And so he calls uh, Mary and sister and Sam and is like, hey, he, you know, I really think that something is going on here. 
and I'm going to try to talk to this weirdo's mother because if she's been up in this window all this time, she probably saw something. Mm-hmm. And they're like, all right, well, I guess uh, meet us back here and let us know how all that goes. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, gotcha. So uh, he goes to the the big creepy house overlooking the motel to try to get a word with uh, Mrs. Bates. And this is where we uh, we get the Arbogast death scene, which is also terrific. It, should, it would be so much better if the shower scene didn't exist. Because hmm. that's such a great scene that by the time you get to this, and it's a really cool shot with oh, the, shot. you know, like mother uh, an overhead shot of mother coming out of the bedroom and stabbing him and he falls backwards down the stairs pinwheeling his arms as blood flows uh from the cut on his face mm-hmm. uh, it's that a gorgeous really, dolly shot oh it's it's fantastic um <laughs> it's such a great shot but again i think it would be sort of the thing the movie was remembered for if there weren't the shower sequence which is you know as we talk about just one of the greatest scenes ever in a movie yeah Uh, at this point in the film the audience is still reeling from the shower scene so they're probably still partially in shock once uh arbogast gets uh taken out yeah well even as a viewer 61 years after the fact i'm like (laughs) what in the fuck (laughs) like every, (laughs) every time somebody gets even a whiff of hey norman bates's mother there may be something up with that immediately murdered horribly (laughs) <laughs> and uh it's it's true i i can't help but think of uh the that trailer that hitchcock did for psycho where he talks about it like oh yes and then he comes down the stairs and his back <laughs> he landed with a crack in his back i just can't even describe it you know yeah it just, oh that Hitchcock was such a. I mean, we've already, we already know about how much of a master he is with the filmmaking. His trailers were spectacular. That six minute theatrical trailer that Bo is talking about, one of the best possible pieces of marketing they could have made. There's literally not one shot from the film in there, and it's six minutes long. It's basically a tour of the property, a tour of the house, a tour of the cabins. And I mean, in 1960 that absolutely would have made me want to go see that film and he did the same thing with rope too i don't know if you remember the rope trailer but the rope trailer was actually a prequel to the movie rope because in the in the trailer we see the character who's murdered in the opening scene of rope so I, i i i'm so like floored by that that hitchcock literally made the trailer for rope the prequel to the movie i absolutely love that (laughs) <laughs> he he had a William Castle-esque kind of delight in teasing the audience. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, he understood that he was manipulating an audience. He, he was a, a showman as much as he was a craftsman. And that's such a rare combination. Like all the little stuff that he would do for Alfred Hitchcock Presents and all the intros and so forth. You know, that, like that shot, I, it, it's on one of the extras, but it's him sitting in that giant pot as he's being cooked with a ladle, <laughs> tasting the the broth. And it's like, you are just P.T. Barnum. Yep. But you're also, <laughs> like, you're P.T. Barnum and you're also Murnau. You know, like you're, it's, it's that rare combination of being able to, to be self-aware about your art and what your your relationship is with your audience but also being a master craftsman mm-hmm. and it's again i don't know that there's anything quite like it maybe spielberg comes kind of close but i don't know that he's got the same level of craftsmanship really mm. you, you know like i think spielberg is great don't get me wrong but you look at his later output like so oh, yeah. <laughs> you know uh uh hitchcock made what 53 54 feature films something like that yeah and this is number 47 yeah it's one of his later ones exactly and and this is as good if not better than almost anything else he did and rope is a couple of years before this rear window my favorite is less than 10 years before this 
Uh, rope is uh, actually 1948, so oh, 12 wow. years. Yeah, rope is an old one. Um, and <laughs> back to, I mean, it's, it, again, I'm, I'm, my love of rope is starting to seep through again. And just, uh, <laughs> his beautiful use of color in that film. And, and uh, again, with the use of light and shadow, because since it is supposedly one continuous shot, um, you have to kind of dim the light outside because, you know, to show the passage of day to night. And, you know, uh, again, just an absolute auteur, the, <laughs> the, 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 the length that he went to. To, to make us, even if even if it's something that we don't notice, maybe it's just something that we might notice subconsciously, the lengths that he went to put that in there uh, in all of his films, you know, like I, I, I go back to the crow behind Marion Crane in the parlor. It's like, how many directors would even think of doing that? Ugh. Yeah, Amazing. and inconsistently, and you know, not just mm -hmm. in this movie or this scene, it is throughout his career, he, you know, the fact that he, he worked for a while in Germany, you know, as sort of a contemporary of a lot of those German expressionists, so he he was sort of, you know, Bane like, you know, I was I was <laughs> born in it, um, but he was <laughs> he, he was kind of steeped in that idea of expressionist filmmaking, mm -hmm. but also had the heart of of a, a thrill seeker, and so his movies are all really fun sometimes intricate sometimes very straightforward but they're all kind of thriller and suspense films and and not just these completely subjective artistic expressions like it, it like i said it's this weird blend of knowing how to express himself in a visual medium in sometimes a very abstract kind of way with you know symbolism and shadow and all that kind of thing but also being able to engage an audience like you, he pitches to everybody. It, it, it's not, he, he's not aiming for the cheap seats, but everybody is going to love the movie because there's a little something for everyone in his movies. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's, it's head scratching how good he is. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's like frustrating. You, you want to punch somebody in the face uh, because you know, anytime somebody's like, well, the best filmmaker of all time, probably Martin Scorsese. It's like, have you ever watched Alfred Hitchcock? <laughs> what is wrong with you? I mean, Scorsese's brilliant. No question about it. But Scorsese himself will tell you, like we talked about with Raging Bull, like he is just <laughs> stealing Hitchcock. <laughs> you know, um, De Palma, who is, you know, outright thieves from <laughs> uh, from Hitchcock's work is only as good as the Hitchcock that he's stealing from. Um. <laughs> It, it's yeah anyway sorry sorry for that rant but <laughs> i <laughs> i get angry um but yeah so after balsam dies uh who is with the film for far too short a time mm -hmm. but that's where uh sam and um marion's sister lily lily decide that hey we should probably talk to some cops because uh, your sister has gone missing, and now the guy who was looking for your sister has gone missing. So they go to the the sheriff, who is uh, wonderfully played uh, by John McIntyre, Sheriff Al, mm -hmm. and they kind of wake him up in the middle of the night. Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. And they're just like, hey... So this, our detective pal, Arbogast, went out to check out Norman Bates in the Bates Motel and was going to go talk to Norman's mother. And he, he hasn't come back. And my sister's gone missing, too. And, and Sheriff Al tries to reason with him a little bit. He's like, well, you know, people people go missing all the time. And this detective might have just been pulling her like Maybe he found a lead and took off. And mm -hmm. they're like, no, no, no. He said he was going to tell us. And he's like, all right, look. Let me level with you. First of all, is Norman Bates a weirdo? Sure. Nobody's arguing that. <laughs> he keeps to himself, doesn't come into town much. He's a real uh, a, a real introvert. But as far as his mother, she's been buried in the cemetery for some time. <laughs> so if your pal Arbogast was going to talk to Norman Bates' mother, I'd really like to know who's buried in that grave. Oh, I love that line, too. The fact that the cop 
even when he's at home off duty, he's still a cop because instantly he shows concern for the potential innocent woman that's buried in, in Norma Bates' grave. I, I I thought that was just amazing. And then the scene fades out right there, kind of leaving you with that idea of, oh man, that they, you know, what what the hell's going on? I, uh, just more brilliant filmmaking. Yeah, and it, and it heightens the mystery so well. And it's one of those <laughs> things you forget if you're a dumb dumb like me and haven't watched the movie in a while, you're like, oh right, the, the a lot of this movie is a big mystery yeah. of who is who is killing these people if not Norman Bates's mother, and if it is Norman Bates's mother, then you know who who is buried out in the cemetery. Yep, and <laughs> and so that kind of leads us to the big climax of the film where. Uh, Sam and Lily go to investigate the the Bates Motel on their own, and they show up to uh, pretend to be a married couple, <laughs> um, and and snoop around the place without drawing any suspicion. Kind of funny how they uh, pretend to be a married couple, and then uh, what twenty eight years later we find out they did get married. That's but that's right. a story for another show. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. We'll get to it. Don't just you wait. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, the idea is that Sam is going to go talk to Norman and keep him occupied by telling him long, boring stories about real estate or travel on the road or something. And meanwhile, Lily will, will sneak up to the house and try to talk to his mother and figure out what's going on. But what we, uh, learn when we get up there is that uh well all right so lily goes creeping around the house she finds the bedroom where there is the silhouette of a body sunken into the mattress (laughs) which is not a good sign yep (laughs) and and then norman bates kind of figures out like hey is sam trying to keep me preoccupied yeah I kind of had an issue with Sam in that scene because Sam gets mouthy with Norman really quick. Obviously, he's upset. Uh, He believes that Norman has something to do with Marion's disappearance. Uh, So I understand the emotion. But why would you purposely want to antagonize someone who's capable of murder? Like, if you think that he did something to uh, to Marion to take the money... Why would you antagonize him like that? That never made sense to me. But, I mean, I understand Sam is a big dude. He's taller than Norman, so maybe he thought that he could physically handle him. But I still don't understand the mentality of purposely antagonizing someone capable of what he's done. It's, it's a little yeah. weird to me. I, I think that's. I think Sam's just a big meathead. And I, <laughs> yeah. and I do think that he believes, hey, if push come to shove, I can take this guy right out. Like, I'm... <laughs> I'm a quarterback. This guy is a wide receiver. <laughs> That's valid. Yeah. You know, and and so I'll I'll knock him down, knock his block off, as they say, in the uh, the 1960s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so Norman it figures out like, hey, uh, I I need to go check uh, on something at the house. And so he heads back to the house. Lily hears him come in, and is trying to figure out how to sneak back out, but then realizes oh there's a basement (laughs) and perhaps i should go down there and see what's what and and this is kind of the other iconic scene of the movie is her going into this basement seeing uh a woman presumably with her back turned to lily and uh she's like hey mrs bates i've got a lot of questions for you about my sister and then the uh, she touches the the shoulder of this presumed woman. The chair spins around, and it is the corpse, uh, uh, the stuffed uh, corpse of Norman's mother, <laughs> with a wig on. <laughs> and uh, Lily freaks out. She screams, throws up her hands. The light bulb goes swinging which has been ripped off in every movie since. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, Norman's mother attacks, in quotes, um, and it is, of course, Norman Bates dressed up uh, like his deceased mother 
but before he can uh, he can kill Lily, um, Sam shows up to stop him, ripping off the wig and opening the dress uh, to show that it is in fact Norman Bates inside this mm-hmm. getup, and Norman Bates then uh, basically just kind of collapses in his arms. Um, yeah. You know, with, with a rictus of terror and fear on his face. Yeah. Um, this scene also has another example of some brilliant sound design that I just have to point out. Um, I'm sure most people notice that as Norman is being attacked, there's kind of dialogue kind of going back and forth. If you listen very carefully, and you don't even have to listen all that carefully, it, it's fairly obvious. As Sam is taking Norman down, we hear in Norma's voice, I'm Norma Bates. But um, Norman's mouth isn't moving at that exact moment. Yeah. Oh, I I think that is an absolute brilliant use of audio there. And what's funny is that I remember the Exploding Heads guys kind of making fun of that, kind of making fun of the whole I'm Norma Bates line. Personally, I think it's absolutely brilliant, especially because, like I said, Norman doesn't mouth the word. So did Sam and Lily also hear that? Is that are we hearing Norman's inner monologue at this point? It it, it throws just enough question into it that it it just makes the scene so much more thoughtful to me. And I, I, I just it's one of those examples of the sound design in this movie that just absolutely floor me. Um, I, I, and I will fully admit, I didn't notice it the first couple of times I watched it. I, obviously, now I can't unnotice it. You know, it, it's just, it's so loud. Now it's loud to me. It's like the, she's screaming, I'm Norma Bates. Um, but yeah, wow. I, I absolutely adore that use of uh, dialogue there. Well, and I think it calls back to the scene with uh, Marion Crane in her car when she's having those sort of fantasies. About yeah, yeah. the conversations that are taking place about her now that she's taken off with the money where you hear, you know, her boss talking and the right. Texan talking and all that stuff. And and there's a real, like, subjective point of view often in this movie, whether it's yeah. Norman talking to his mother, where whether it's Marianne imagining these conversations, or like you said in this last scene, where it's almost this, it, it's it's almost the utter loss of self as we'll learn like this is the moment where norman bates ceases to be yeah exactly that's what i mean that that line of dialogue is so um just heavy powerful symbolic whatever adjective you want to go with um just to kind of pinpoint the exact moment when for all intents and purposes norman bates is dead he is gone forever and uh, just ah I can't and, talk enough about that scene. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's fantastic. And, and it's also a repetition of that Bernard Herrmann, you know, the shower score mm-hmm. where we get the the attack sound again and the screeching. And then we go to the expositional ending of the, of the film, um, which I know some people have voiced complaints about, but I really like it. I like it, but I still will say it's a little long. Now, I understand why it's so detailed. I mean, this is a 1960 audience potentially watching this movie, and maybe they kind of needed their hand held a little bit more. Um, If this movie was made in 2021, you know, for the first time, I fully believe that scene would not have been as long because, you know, for whatever it's worth, audiences are a little bit more savvy, especially horror audiences. I think, you know, a little tiny bit of exposition uh, exposition would have been enough for a modern audience, but I understand why they did it in 1960, but even watching it today, um, about three quarters of the way through that scene, it's like, okay, dude, I'm pretty sure everybody in the room gets it. (laughs) Well, clearly not, because there are a lot of dumb questions floating around that room. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) As Dr. Richmond is like, well, it turns out that... Norman Bates has been wearing his mother's clothes and somebody's like, Oh, wait, I got a couple of questions here, doc. First of all, is he's just some kind of crazy transvestite? He's like, Nope, Nope. That's, <laughs> that's not what's going on here. Thing. I, I was going to say there are no dumb questions and then you spoke up. So thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> I love that. He has to explain how a transvestite works to this guy. <laughs> right. But you know, as, as they talk about the extras, like that was one of the things that the MPAA almost didn't allow in the film. Mm-hmm. because they were like, are you trying to pull something on us and be sexy without <laughs> us knowing about it? And, and 
you know, and Joe Stefano, the the writer of Psycho, uh, and it's a brilliant script, by the way. Like mm-hmm. we haven't mentioned his name, and we should. It's a yeah. terrific script, and even Robert Block's original book, just amazing. If you've read it, yeah, I honestly, I never have. I, I haven't finished read. it, but I, I I've read like chapters here and there over the last I don't know twenty five to thirty years, but it really is incredibly well written. And well, yeah, Robert Block's a great writer, but yep. mm-hmm. but Joe Stefano clearly had a vision for what this was going to be. Like the Marion Crane thing was not nearly as big a deal in the book as I understand it. Yep. Uh, it I mean, it happens, but it's not you know half of the movie or half of no. the book. Um, but. And Joe Stefano uh, famously was in therapy at the time that he wrote this script. And so when you hear Dr. Richmond talking about what is going on with Norman Bates, that is all based on the Freudian psychotherapy that uh, Joe Stefano himself was undergoing. Mm-hmm. And, and so to that end, I think the movie is maybe not progressive, but certainly not judgmental. And so when they talk, you know, when this dumb sheriff is like, well, what about transvestites? And the, the doctor is like, no dummy. That's not, no, that it, it, it no, this is just a guy who c- killed his mother, committed matricide. And the idea of that was so destructive to his ego that he basically couldn't face the fact that he had done this. And so he created the persona of his mother so that in, in an effect he hadn't killed his mother at all. And exactly. I mean, the, the act of killing his mother basically gave Norman uh, a disassociative identity. uh, What is it? Yeah. DID. Disassociative. Basically split personality. uh, uh, Yeah. (laughs) Identity disorder. I think is what it is. Disorder. Thank you. And yeah, which I think is really like that's a modern idea for all intents and purposes mm-hmm. for a movie that's you know sixty plus years old now, uh, which, which I find fascinating. And sure enough, he's like, look, eventually, you know, this one of these personalities had to become the dominant personality, and the mother persona gained more and more control, so much so that they were having conversations with one another and then eventually the mother persona took over entirely and what you see now in that room is not Norman Bates Norman Bates for all intents and purposes is gone and what is left is his mother and then we cut to the the final shot of the movie which is Anthony Perkins uh, being brought a blanket to, to comfort him uh like a shawl and sitting in a chair and it's again that subjective kind of inner monologue except it's his mother talking and saying you know my son was such a fuck up that he led us to this place (laughs) where now i'm in trouble for his actions and there oh man the the shot of like the fly crawling on his hand (laughs) awesome and his mother says, "Like, well, I'm I'm not even gonna touch that fly. Why? If they're watching me, they'll say she's so sweet. She never even heard a fly." <laughs> and then that shot right after that line is so effective for me. Uh, a lot of people, maybe not a lot, uh, a few people don't even notice the superimposed image of Norman's mother over his as the scene fades to them pulling Marion Crane's car out of the bog. I, I I think that shot that literally it's like a two second shot and I think it's just one of the most effective shots in the movie to really hammer the point home that this is no longer Norman this is Norma yeah and you know we all have to just accept it <laughs> yeah it, it's terrific and then the final shot of the movie is the car uh, mm-hmm. uh, Marion Crane's car along with her body presumably in the trunk <laughs> being pulled out of uh, this mud pit. And, you know, and the, the uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Richmond, also suggested that, oh, this isn't the first time he killed, that there are a number of women who have gone missing mm-hmm. in this area, and they were probably victims of, of Norman Bates. 
and and I always read it. I know that uh, on on some of the making of stuff when they were talking to some of the creators, they were saying, "Well, this is sort of like well, we're t- we're returning the story to Marion Crane, and and we're showing that there's some kind of justice for her in some way." Um, I kind of have have a different read on it, mm-hmm. which is as soon as you see the car sink into the muck at at that moment in the film when after Norman's killed um, Marion Crane that that is where you descend fully into madness and at, and the car coming out of the muck is basically the audience being allowed to breathe again of like oh no 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 it's over now like you can yeah. you can go back out into the daylight you can leave the theater now <laughs> you're you're fine like the roller coaster ride has ended yeah I, I can agree with that absolutely uh, but oh, it's, I mean, and that's uh, you know, as you said, you could you could pick apart every little scene in this movie oh, yeah. to some degree. But those are the broad strokes of the story, and um, and you know, the the other thing I want to highlight here are some of the performances. We talked a, a little bit about yeah. Janet Lee, who I think is is so perfect not just because she was a star, but because she seems like the focus of the movie. She's so confident in the role, even though her character is a little scattered and, and so forth, but just as an actor, you know, she, Vivian Lee is just amazing. Or I'm sorry, Janet Lee, <laughs> uh, Vivian Lee, Janet Lee is just, uh, like she, she is so fully present in that role mm-hmm. that up until the moment that she's murdered, it's like, well, of course this is the character I'm following. Like she's interesting and, and she's conflicted and, and she's got a moral center, but she's also complicated and does the, this stupid spur of the moment thing. And, and Janet Lee just does a, such an amazing job of embodying all of that in a way that seems effortless. Yeah, her her level of confidence at the beginning of the movie. I mean, it, it almost comes off like she's the real estate agent, not that you know she works for one. Just the way she carries herself, uh, you know, her very kind of matter of fact way of speaking. Just yeah, everything about this performance is amazing. And that, of course, leads us to the other. Uh, by the way, she won, I think, a Golden Globe for this performance. She did. She oh, was good. nominated for an Oscar, did not win but did win a golden globe for best supporting actress was the category. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, Anthony Perkins on the other hand, um, <laughs> a role that kind of damned him in a way mm-hmm. where he could never not be seen as Norman Bates again, because he is so good <laughs> yeah. as Norman Bates, but he is astounding in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's almost a flawless performance. There's there's really no critique I could possibly give uh, Anthony Hopkins' performance in this movie. It is stellar, absolutely Oscar worthy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's vulnerable at times. It's very sweet and and vulnerable at times. It's incredibly dark at times, and and he turns on a dime, and it doesn't feel jarring. It just it. It feels like you're, you know, you're just watching this psyche unfold before you. Mm-hmm. And and Hitchcock, famously, not an actor's director. <laughs> you know, like his direction to Janet Lee was essentially, all right, I'm going to move the camera and you need to move when I move the camera. And if you have trouble with that, let me know. Otherwise, just do whatever it is that you actors do. <laughs> and And so... Even in that Truffaut conversation, when Truffaut was kind of asking him questions about Perkins' performance and his mannerisms, and Hitchcock was like, I, I guess "I'll ask him the next time I see him." I guess I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, we didn't really talk about it. <laughs> you know, because uh, you know that that's sort of uh, I think the separation between him and a Kubrick is Kubrick would go to these extreme lengths to get very particular performances from his mm-hmm. actors. Uh, and Hitchcock just didn't seem to give a shit. Um, I'd like to chalk it up as he, as him having a, a higher level of trust for his actors, potentially. 
I know a lot of directors, you know, tend to trust their actors, especially if they come to the production with a big name. They tend to assume maybe they don't need as much direction, blah, blah, blah. But obviously, you know, Kubrick would be the complete uh, antithesis of that. But yeah. maybe it's a Coen Brothers thing, because I, I hear the same thing about their sets, which is mm-hmm. they're very particular and they know what they want, but they don't give a lot of actor direction. And hmm. maybe it's just like, hey, all the 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 acting direction is done in the casting you yeah, know I, that that hitchcock wanted anthony perkins because he knew what anthony perkins could do exactly and uh so but he's he's so so good and uh like there's the the bit about him eating the candy corn which seems to be an invention of anthony perkins <laughs> um which i really like uh and the other performance i think is like i think Vera Miles is is fine in it, but I think both uh, Vera Miles and John Gavin, who plays Sam Sam Nunes, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I wonder where Carpenter got all his names. Anyway, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I th- I think they are much more steeped in the more traditional stage acting style that you saw in movies from the 40s and 50s mm-hmm. that kind of pre-brando kind of performance um where no, definitely very uh, both of them i mean the nature of their characters are very frantic because of the nature of the situation so I, yeah their performances i i feel though not stellar absolutely fit the character and the situation for sure um i i think it's just you know there are the Stella, Stella Adler actors and then there yeah. are the non-Stella Adler actors and I think these are the non-Stella Adler actors and <laughs> and the thing that gets me through that and I don't think they're bad for performances I don't mean that at all no, I just no. mean they're very they they have that kind of uh you know we're we're trying to enunciate for the back row kind of feel yeah. as opposed to Martin Balsam as Arbogast, who is the, you know, he is one uh, flask in his pocket away from being the kind of grizzled that you would see in a private detective movie. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and I love his character. I love his performance. He's, he's the right kind of jaded. And, like, when he's talking to uh, Lily, and it's just like, look, uh, normally I'd say that both of you are full of shit, but you're both so innocent and stupid. I kind of believe you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and I really like all of that stuff. Um, but are any other big performances that, that you like? I mean, there, there aren't that many actors in this. Ultimately. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously, you know, Norman, Sam, Lily, and Marion kind of take up the majority of screen time here. Um, obviously, uh, uh, with the detective, you know, Balsam, <laughs> who I'm a huge fan of specifically for Death Wish 3. I know it's a weird sure, reference, but sure. I absolutely love that movie. And the, what, literally, I, I had seen that movie before I saw Psycho. So when Martin Balsam first shows up on screen, I'm like, hey, it's the old dude from Death Wish. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, I am... I mean, his as you mentioned, his performance very organic, very believable. Um, absolutely, as far as any other performances that really, really stand out. I mean, not really. I mean, the sheriff's wife is kind of kooky, but at the same time, they were just woken up at like two in the morning, so I can almost understand the kind of the shortness of that conversation. Um, if anything, they were almost too polite for having just been woken up. Um, also, why the hell did they wake him up? Are, are you telling me there's no active duty police officers at night in that town? You had to go wake up the, the sheriff? Kind of an odd choice. <laughs> it was probably but, like some deputy that was like, look, I'm <laughs> not going to the Bates Motel. You want to go to the Bates Motel, you talk to the sheriff. He's at home. I wouldn't wake him up. But if you do, whatever. <laughs> uh, valid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, but like you said, the cast is so small, you know, um, the brunt of the great performances are taken up by like, you know, three or four actors. So, you know, everybody else is, uh, you know, very passable. I have, I have no issues with any of the performances. Actually, I did want to point out the used car salesman. I think he did a great job. Yeah. John Anderson is that actor's name. He's terrific. Yeah, you're right. 
Ah, uh, yeah, that was I. It was on this watch that I, I kind of really started to uh, like his performance, and it was specifically, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, when he's talking about how no, it's not illegal to buy a car; it's just highly un- or to buy a car with cash. It's just highly unusual. I, I mean, that was just absolutely perfect, you know. Um, uh, you know, a car salesman who's kind of looking out for his own best interest too, because if that car does turn out to be stolen or used in a drug deal or a murder or something, obviously he's going to be partially liable for that. But yeah, I, I, I got to say, I, I, uh, John Anderson's performance there. I mean, we only get him for what, like five, six minutes, but it definitely leaves an impression with me. Yeah, he's terrific. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so. We talked a lot about the birds, and we talked about the shadows. Um, <laughs> the other big theme in this, and this is something that I think runs through a lot of Hitchcock's work, is the idea that just beneath the surface of the normal and the routine is something awful. <clears throat> and in particular, this, this idea that... <laughs> The moment that you feel like there is love or like genuine love or hope, that's wrong and stupid of you for thinking it. (laughs) The funny thing is, is that the way he edits his movies, that's what he wants us to think. I mean, um, especially we've talked about the use of light and shadow. There's also the use of the score and how um, there are different um, sound designers who kind of talk about how Hitchcock in this film would have uh, like scenes where good things were happening there would be no score like you know when when marion is in bed with sam no music playing but then as soon as something bad happens that's when you start to hear score and it starts right from when marion kind of uh sees her boss as she's leaving phoenix like as soon as she pulls away there's the famous you know uh, the opening theme if you will and even though we're not 100% sure that necessarily something awful is happening right there. The music indicates it. So subconsciously, you know something bad is happening or has happened. Uh, same thing with when she pulls away from the cop. We hear that opening, you know, the shrill uh, uh, strings again. And even though it seems like just a normal interaction, you know, a, a tired motorist and a, poli- and a concerned police officer, uh, as she's pulling away and that music is playing, it's very obvious that, oh, something kind of major happened right now and maybe on first watch you don't get that but the score will still indicate it subconsciously so yeah yeah and the big example of this probably is as we talked about the moment where marion crane decides hey i'm i'm gonna turn around and face the yeah. music and yep. is immediately murdered for her efforts yeah um you know the the stuff with martin balsam like anytime that you search for truth that's going to get you in trouble if you uh anytime that you kind of rail against the chaos of life that's that's going to get you either killed or maimed or hurt or whatever and Mm -hmm. and even poor lily like just uh, again it's the search for truth right like i'm gonna go into this house find this old woman and just try to find out what happened to my sister and for her troubles she is traumatized for life by seeing this corpse Mm. and then almost murdered yeah, and and I mean, I, like you said, we don't see him for another twenty plus years, but it, you know, the, like we don't see those characters again because, as far as Hitchcock is concerned, on a thematic and and filmic level, they don't matter anymore. Yep. Oh, that's valid. You know, and it's uh, it, it like Hitchcock has a shockingly dark view of like it, it's darkly comic at times i was gonna say he's got a comedic dark view yeah (laughs) you know yeah there's a definite like tongue-in-cheek kind of approach to it but i don't think hitchcock thinks much of humanity i can agree with that (laughs) you know i mean starting with like shadow of a doubt and you know and rope and even rear window i mean rear window is nothing but like beneath it's very blue velvet in the sense of like hey underneath the seemingly ordinary lives of our neighbors everybody's got something really fucked up going on (laughs) up to and including murder um but yeah it it, there there is something bleak about hitchcock in general uh yeah he definitely punishes people for rocking the boat if you're not just a cog in the machine minding your own business uh you're gonna have problems in a hitchcock film (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. And and cops are always a threat. Yep. They're they're always a source of anxiety. Um and yeah, I think that unless you're just very quietly head down going about your business, then, you know, uh was it the long nail that gets the hammer? And <laughs> <laughs> and and I think Hitchcock kind of believes that. I wonder if he, uh, I wonder if his sets are like that. Like if you uh, if you go kind of either against him or vocal, you know, vocalize an opposite opinion. If he's just like in his mind, oh, I'd like to kill you right now. But no. Well, what, <laughs> it, it, uh-huh. well, I was going to say an example of that would be that story that the assistant director tells about oh, right. the you know that first night when. They're doing the the shot where uh, Janet Lee pulls up in the car and it's raining outside the motel and all that. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, tested the rain machines and got the the shot just right. And Hitchcock comes in and immediately is like, well, you didn't pay very much attention, did you? (laughs) And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, look, right there, it's a full moon, you dumb dumb. (laughs) And he was like, yeah, we had to have two grips wander around with a, you know, a pole and a big you know black blackout panel to Mm -hmm. hide the moon and and when he got mad about uh i don't i remember what he was angry about it was something about the cinematographer or something Hmm. and he yelled at the assistant director about it rather than the cinematographer but in earshot of the cinematographer Ah, yes and (laughs) it's yeah and so there's i think he ran and he was also out by six Another thing I like about Hitchcock, he wasn't he wasn't huh. gonna shoot for fourteen hours a day. Screw oh, that. <laughs> uh, but I imagine his sets were very regimented. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine they would be anything but. Um. All right. Let, let's get to some you know final impressions, sh- just stuff we haven't talked about that that we kind of want to. Um, mm-hmm. And one thing for me that I really love about this. Uh, and it's something I like in modern films when when a good director can pull it off. I'm looking at you, Robert Eggers, um, <laughs> someone who can do black and white well. Ah, uh, yes. And like Psycho came out. I know it seems like 1960 was an eternity ago, and I guess it kind of is. But movies were in color. His m- movies before that were in color. Mm-hmm. It's just that black and white was cheaper. And he was trying to do this movie on the cheap. And also, he was afraid that all the blood would get uh, the MPA riled up. So if you do it in black and white, well, it's just some, you know, some chocolate syrup going down the drain. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Which I love. I love both of those things equally. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. This movie in black and white was an absolute great choice. Um I just plus the movie opens in Phoenix and then you go to a more rural area, um, you know, after about the half hour mark. And I feel like the black and white just fits better. The the look of the house, the look of the cabins, um, just all of it. In my opinion, it's just so much more vibrant in black and white. And to just give us how can I put it? Like with Hitchcock's uh choice to make this black and white it's like he's giving the audience the option to fill in what they think it might look like what color is that owl on the wall what color is that songbird there blah 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 it it, it almost because i I notice myself kind of doing it sometimes where i'll watch a black and white movie i'll be watching actively watching a black and white movie but in my head it's color i don't know i don't know if that sounds insane but yeah that's kind of the way i am but with with psycho and with the truly great black and white movies i don't do that i never picture psycho in color you know like young frankenstein for example you know the the great mel brooks comedy from 79 is in black and white when i watch it it's in color in my head but this movie no there's no reason for me to fill in the blanks because it's it's a near flawless film so Weirdly, I, I, I have the inverse effect with uh, Robert Eggers' The Witch, where I, <laughs> I'm like, I'd, that movie I think is in color, but it feels like it ought to be in black and white to me. I'll go with that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but maybe that's just because I love The Lighthouse so much. Oh, same here. <laughs> and, and I think Robert Eggers should never do a color film. 
You know, Ooh, I don't know. I do love the witch, though. I do I, that final scene. Uh, yeah, the, the vibrant fire in the middle of the circle. Ah, I love it. Like if he would have done the whole movie in black and white, but then as soon as uh, you know, uh, Black Philip shows up at the end in human form, if it if it would have gone to color there, I I think that would have been so powerful, so effective. But. Ultimately, The Witch is my favorite movie of the decade, so yeah. I have very little complaints about it. M make it an unpleasant vill. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yes, I like that. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, another another thing that I really enjoy about this movie we haven't talked about yet. Um, I like, uh, and this, uh, again, comes from the Truffaut conversation, which I think is really interesting, um, where Hitchcock talks about how in this movie in particular, the effect that it had on the audience. Um, you know, there was the whole gimmick about like, hey, once the movie starts, we're not going to let anybody be seated uh, because he didn't want anyone to come in halfway through and be like, where the fuck is Jan Janet Lee in this movie? <laughs> uh, so he was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to send out a, th uh, a, a statement and we're going to make a, a, a press release and say that, uh, theater managers, if somebody comes in late, we're just not going to let them enter the theater. They, they just have to wait around for the next showing. And sure enough, uh, theater owners went along with it, which was, was interesting. But mm -hmm. in particular, and th this has a lot to do with the, the shower sequence, but Hitchcock said the thing that this movie proved was that it didn't matter who the characters were. It didn't matter what the plot was what mattered was the power of film that you could put shots together in a very specific way and create this reaction in audiences. And it might like, could it be heightened by the fact that you were interested in the characters and all that? Of course. Mm -hmm. But even without that, if you just showed that shower sequence to somebody, they're going to have a reaction to it. And the way that people left the theater in, you know, 1960 after seeing Psycho was, the, and they described it as a roller coaster. I think it was uh, his wife, Alma, um, who said that she would go to these screenings and she would come back to report to Hitchcock that like, oh yeah, people left the theaters laughing, but they were laughing because it was the release of the fear that they've been feeling. Oh yeah. And it was yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the same reaction of getting off a roller coaster of like, I can't believe I did that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Laughter is definitely the great equalizer uh, of fear. And uh, my wife kind of has a fear response where she just starts laughing when she's incredibly scared of something. So, yeah, um, it, it makes absolute sense that people wa would walk out of uh, psycho laughing. I don't know that I would have walked out laughing so much as having an ear to ear grin on my face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, but that that is part of it too of Hitchcock saying like th this movie proved that you can you can absolutely manipulate an audience that you can just have like you know pulling puppet strings and I'm gonna have them scream here they're gonna relax here they're gonna scream again here mm -hmm. and then at the end of it they're going to they're gonna have this kind of release and it's in a weird way it's Hitchcock recognizing his own power and in a way that I mean not that he didn't understand the manipulation of like you know saboteur or something like that but it was it was that you don't even need the trappings of the plot to, to create like the bomb under the table doesn't matter you you don't have to show the, the you know the bomb hidden under the table and all the people dancing around it Oh, I love that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that this is just saying, just, just showing you the bomb and that can be just as effective. Yeah. I mean, Hitchcock, I feel that Hitchcock more than any other director understood the power of film, whether he saw himself as an auteur or not, he understood the power of the medium. And ultimately that just that knowledge alone is going to add so much to your films. I mean, you know, we've seen obviously countless directors come and go that don't come anywhere near um, the uh, the artistic value of a Hitchcock film. But there, but you can still tell when a director understands the power of their medium. 
Um, you know, Robert Eggers is another is another one. I absolutely feel that he he is an, an absolute master storyteller, and he like Hitchcock understands the power of the medium. So yeah, um, I, I would say that Hitchcock was probably one of the first, if not um, the most uh, recognizable, to really you know recognize that or uh, to to you know make the the realization that I can literally change people's lives in ninety minutes. And he he did it, and just it makes him one of my favorite directors ever. Uh, just an infallible master that I, I just I, I almost have nothing negative to say about the man. It's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> I mean maybe a creepy relationship with some of his lead actresses, but you know. uh, yeah, well. <laughs> um, all right, so I've got one more thing, and then I'll, I'm just going to turn it over to you, and you can talk about whatever you want. But uh, the other thing I found really interesting. In, in some of the bonus material on that box set for uh, Psycho is that there was a scene when they when they were like, look, the, the movie's too long. We've got to cut it down. And they got rid of a scene with Lily and Sam where the two of them just have a conversation where we sort of get a little more information about each of their characters and, and sort of not a romantic relationship between them, but more of a, it it just brought them closer together. And the line that Lily has is that she didn't go to school. She went to work also. Mm -hmm. And, but, and she says, but I think my sister wanted to sacrifice for me and I didn't let her do that. And I think she resented me because some people have the need to sacrifice themselves just for the sake of sacrifice Hmm. and it was a really interesting line and it was a an an interesting scene between these characters and it just i don't think it ever got shot it was just something in the script that they had to cut out for Mm -hmm. time reasons for to get the the film down because you know hitchcock was watching dailies every day and kind of cutting the movie as he went um so that he knew that they were going to be over long um but it, I, I think if I have a complaint with Psycho, it's that those two, the characters of Sam and Lily, feel a little thin, and I, I would have liked to have seen that scene because I think that might have resolved that very minor issue for me. Hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. No, that's valid. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like we got what we needed from Sam and Lily from the theatrical cut. Yes, I agree. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more character development for the both of them pre Marion's disappearance. But at the same time, I, I can't really, um, I can't really say that the movie quote unquote needs that scene. Um, like I said, I totally agree with you. Um, but the, the movie's already an hour and what, almost 50 minutes long for 1960. That's monstrous. You know, you didn't get two hour movies back then. Right. So the the 10 commandments. (laughs) Yes, exactly. You're not getting Ben Hur at the theater every weekend. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, Marvel could learn a thing or two. Oh yes, please. I I, I can't hold my piss for three and a half hours. Come on. Yes. I look, (laughs) I appreciate it. I'm, I, I'm a nerd for that stuff, but also let's Ant-Man and the Wasp doesn't need to be two twenty. Let's just, let's let's be honest with one (laughs) Uh, what what other stuff have, haven't we covered that you would like to discuss? Because uh, you are a font, sir. <laughs> I mean, as I peruse my notes here, we pretty much touched on almost everything that I wanted to touch upon. Um, obviously, I have a lot here written about the sur- the bird symbolism. I mean, you can't escape it. Um, we didn't really bring up much about the the predator and prey kind of themes throughout the movie i mean they're very obvious uh especially in that parlor scene where we're talking about the different birds especially how the song birds are in docile positions whereas the birds of prey are all in attack positions like i said very symbolic of norman's view on women in general um whether that includes his mother or not I would imagine he probably looks at his mother more as a bird of prey, but you know, again, uh, that's up for interpretation. But like I said, all the references in here um, with, with predator and prey, uh, the movie takes place in Phoenix, uh, you know, the famous bird that rises from the ashes after it dies, Marion Crane. 
a crane is a large bird no known for its beauty you know once again Mar- uh, marion being a very beautiful woman we talked about the birds that surround her in the scene uh we talked about how uh the birds that are in the shot when norman's in a good mood change as opposed to when he's in a bad mood i really really like all of that and then what was hitchcock's next movie the bird yes how much ah how do i love that it's so amazing and it's funny because i mean i like the bird i like everything hitchcock did there there isn't anything that hitchcock has done that i don't at least mildly enjoy but i mean for me the birds is actually one of his weaker films if you will it's a it's a crazy statement to make but i i've always felt this way i love the birds don't get me wrong i'm not gonna sit here and say negative things about it but it's just one of those things that I feel like after 1960, we kind of see Hitchcock um, kind of maybe go for ideas that he might not have gone for. Like, I don't I don't see Hitchcock doing a creature feature in the 40s. You know what I mean? Like, 40s Hitchcock is above creature features, whereas then we get to the 60s, he does Psycho, he does The Birds, and... You know, I, I like I said, I, I don't want to say anything too negative about him because I do absolutely love the man. Um, like I said, one of my favorite directors, if not my favorite director ever. Um, I could talk about the man for absolute hours. But yeah, Birds, for whatever it's worth, a little bit of a downturn, especially, I mean, Psycho. Psycho is such a stellar film. Almost anything he makes after this is going to be a little bit of a step back. But for whatever it's worth, yeah. Um the, the like I said, the the, avi, the aviary themes throughout the movie that then lead into his film, The Birds. I mean, hell, The Birds doesn't have as many bird references. In this movie, so go figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that movie's more about phone booths, really. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's an indictment of the public phone system. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, even I, oh, I one thing that we didn't really touch on um, throughout is um, costume design. Um, we, we talked earlier, we, we very briefly mentioned how in the opening scene, Marion is wearing all white. She's got a white skirt on and a white bra. But then in the scene after she takes the money, what's she wearing? A black bra and a black skirt. And for the majority of the rest of the film, she's for the most part wearing darker colors. Um, but then there's even, you can even talk a little bit about the symbolism of her getting rid of the black car and buying a lighter colored car, a tan car, after trading in the black car. Even though that's well before she makes the decision to go back to Phoenix and face the music, I feel like that is a very subtle kind of clue to the viewers that she's starting to think about it. You know, she start, she's starting to feel bad, basically. Like, after she trades in the car... She start, And then she has the rest of the drive, which is, you know, all the inner monologue in her head of everything that she's picturing happening. Um, I feel like that's the scene where she's starting to have second thoughts. She's starting to have doubts that she's going to be able to get away with this. Obviously, the interaction with the cop kind of, you know, is the first clue that she's probably not really going to get away with this. But um Oh, man. Like I said, I can talk Hitchcock for hours and hours and hours. Um, it, it's the kind of thing where you need to shut me up or I'm going to keep going. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, here's how we'll we'll put a, a lid on this then is <laughs> we will give this movie a rating uh, here on the Dark Parade. We do five stars, mm-hmm. uh, one to five. Um, and look, uh, I'll just go ahead and, and put my Hitchcock on the table. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, this is clearly a five star movie. It's just one yeah. of the greatest not just a great horror film just one of the greatest films of all time no it really is i mean you can dissect every single scene in here dissect every single shot see symbolism um you know throughout it's just the man i mean people throw around the word auteur but no hitchcock is the sheer personification of that word at least you know in his professional life you know we'll leave his personal life out of this for now but yeah just you know as a filmmaker there is no equal yeah kubrick comes close for me um like i said the way that he micromanages literally every shot in his film just seems so exhausting to me but then when you see the end product it's like ah that's why he did that so and it's you know the same thing with hitchcock um even though he may not have been as meticulous a micromanager on his sets 
the DNA is still there. You, you can see that he's very much um, the, the boss, if you will, on his sets. Uh, everything is to his liking and no one else's. And, you know, ultimately the end product can't be denied. You know, it, it cannot be overstated what a spectacular film Psycho is and many of his films, you know, be it the Vertigo, Rear Window, whichever you kind of gravitate towards. Obviously, I'm a rope guy, but um, yeah, I, what, what can be said about Hitchcock that hasn't already been said? I feel like I'm just repeating what's been said for the last 50 years. The man is amazing. He deserves all the accolades that he gets and he probably deserved a lot more. Um, as we've said, not, not exactly the most award-winning director ever, or at least not to what, uh, you know, uh, the level that he deserves, but, you know, what are you going to do? So, yeah, five out of five, uh, there's just no denying it. Um, I'm not going to call this a perfect film, because as I said, I have some minor issues with the exposition at the end, and, 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 I, and I mean very minor, like microscopic, um, but it's still an absolute five-star film. It is... It is the sheer definition of a classic and should be watched by everyone. And if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Psycho yet, holy hell, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah, <laughs> you should. Uh, if, if if our conversation proves nothing else, it's, yeah, you should probably watch Psycho. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all right. So we're going to we're gonna wrap this up with three things that you probably know about Psycho, but our listeners may not. Mm -hmm. Um number one on my list of things that you might not know about psycho uh when this movie was being shopped around nobody wanted it mm -hmm. one of the reasons <laughs> that it was so uh the budget on it was so low is that paramount uh who who uh hitchcock owed a film to mm -hmm. did not want to make it not only didn't want to make it didn't even bother to do coverage on the book and had zero interest and it was only when Universal was kind of picking up Hitchcock's contract that they agreed to to fund the movie to some extent, even though Hitchcock's own production company uh, footed some of that bill as well. Uh, yep. But yeah, no, this was a movie nobody wanted made, except for Hitchcock. I mean, you know, I, I, obviously I wasn't around in 1960, but based on what I remember of the 70s, yes, I'm that old. Um, it, it, it actually makes sense that nobody in 1960 would want to put that out. Um, it, it, it's too risque. I mean, you've got talk of, you know, um, uh, you've got talk of casual sex. You've got talk of obviously murder. You've got talk of transvestites. I mean, there's so much, there's so many red flags in the script that it's not surprising. Nobody wanted to foot the bill for it. So yeah, unfortunate, but true. Yeah, so number two, when uh, they the filming began, Hitchcock was so devoted to keeping the idea of who Norman's mother was secret that <laughs> they floated the rumor that they were looking for an actress to fill the part, uh -huh. which led to a number of talent agencies <laughs> submitting their actors for the role of Norman's mother, who, as you may recall, was just a prop dummy. <laughs> But I like that a lot. I like that kind of uh, that those kind of cinematic shenanigans. Oh, absolutely! Oh, God, I, I I used to actually work in film. I'd probably say what, like fifteen, sixteen years ago. I was a sound recordist and boom mic operator out here in California, and yeah, uh, just the, the stuff that goes on on set and just the 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 budgeting and the casting and everything else. It, it, it's it's amazing the effort that goes into one of these films, even an independent film project, which is mostly what I was working on when I was out here. Um, just the level of just detail that goes into it is ridiculous. And then you watch something like Psycho and you realize that it was made for under a million dollars, which, you know, I, I know in 1960, that's still a lot of money, but for a, a large theatrical release, it was still a low budget. And the fact that he foot the bill, he had the guys from his own production company of the TV show come and kind of, you know, work on the movie. It just, I mean, I don't want to call him an early Roger Corman, but you could almost look at it that way. He's an early Roger Corman who actually made really good movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 there is that air uh, about uh -huh. this production in particular. And uh, one final bit of trivia uh, for Psycho, a thing that you may not know about the film Psycho, if you're listening at home. 
Um, this is the first time in a major mo motion picture that a toilet flushing was seen on the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> next time somebody is at a bar, uh, you want to get a, a free drink, you, you bet them what the first movie was featuring a flushing toilet. There you go. And, uh, and that <laughs> film was in fact psycho. So awesome. there you go. That hopefully those, uh, are facts that will make you a little smarter, uh, or a little older. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, this has been fantastic. Uh, <sighs> I really, really appreciate you bringing your expertise to this. Um, I, I thank you so much for having me. I, I will never balk at an opportunity to talk about Hitchcock. Um, obviously being a horror movie podcaster for the most part, I don't really get to talk about the man as much. Um, but yeah, whenever an opportunity arises, I will do it. And, and you yourself, my friend, um, very impressed with all of your, not just your knowledge, but just the, the affinity that you have for this film. You know, I, it, it's the kind of thing where I don't often meet people who have the appreciation for a Hitchcock or a Kubrick that I have. And, you know, I'm not tooting my own horn by any stretch of the imagination. Not I am public. a sin of, <laughs> not in public. No. I have a wife for that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, th I, I can't put into words uh, how much of a treat this was. Uh, this was awesome. Your level of expertise, your passion for the film and Hitchcock in general made this. I mean, wow, we're at the two hour mark and it feels like we just started five minutes ago and I'm ready to go two more hours. <laughs> All right. Well, with that in mind, uh, you, I'm going to seduce you back uh, for a return to uh, Norman Bates. <laughs> it won't be hard my friend you won't have to twist the arm very hard <laughs> uh so we will we will be back in uh in the not too distant future with a look at uh psycho 2 um <laughs> which it, you know a little bit of uh foreshadowing here a sequel that i think is kind of underappreciated Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, and for decades underappreciated. It really feels like only over the last five to ten years that people are really coming around to this movie. But, I mean, I, I remember seeing this in the theater or seeing part two in the theater for the first time. That ending absolutely floored me. You know, I, it, it may be passe nowadays in 2021, but yeah. Two is absolutely an underappreciated film, and I can't wait to break that one down with you, too. Yeah, I think it's like making Gone with the Wind too, you know, <laughs> where, where it's like, well, I mean, it's got all the same characters, I guess, but, mm -hmm. uh, or Godfather 2, well, that's a bad example. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I'm, Jaws 2? I'm, I'm thinking more like The Shining to Dr. Sleep. Oh, see, <laughs> I like Dr. Sleep a lot. Oh, I love Dr. Sleep. Oh, my God. I, that movie has no right to be as good as it is. I, I, a sequel for one of the greatest horror films ever made that comes 40 years after the fact has no right to be that good. And it is amazing. Ha, have easily, you a, easily top three for me for that year. Have you seen well, the uh, director's cut of that? Yes, yes. Oh. I, I, bought the, I bought the UK blue specifically so I could get the director's cut because the American blue didn't have it. Oh. And uh, it's so good. The director's adds, cut is so good. Oh, God, it adds so much emotion to the film. I mean, the film is already emotional as it is, but uh, the, the extra stuff in that director's cut, potentially one of my favorite director's cuts of the last 10 to 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to think of one better, and there's not one off the top of my head. I think Mike Flanagan just works better long form. Oh, by far. Yeah, he's like a Zack Snyder, where if you give them the time that they need to tell a story, they're going to tell a great story. I mean, not to say that he can't make a 90-minute movie either, because he has, and they're they're just as good most of the times. His very first film, Absentia, yeah. micro-budget movie that I, I think has one of the it's one of the most Lovecraftian films without being Lovecraftian, if that mm -hmm. makes sense to you guys. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, yeah, same thing. I mean, I, I, I probably don't put Psycho 2 on the same pedestal that I put Dr. Sleep, but I 100% agree it is underappreciated, and hopefully we can change that just a little bit. Yes, we will, we will be back to discuss that soon. Uh, if you would, let people know where they can find you one more time before we get out of here. Okay, so my main show, No More Room in Hell, 
the side casts to No More Room in Hell are Fresh Cuts and Creature Comforts. Um, I am also, you can also hear me on In the Mic of Madness, It's Not Horror, Okay, and Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. All of my shows are available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network, except for Underwater Kaiju, which has a home right here on Legion Podcasts. Excellent. You'll be able to find all of that stuff uh, in the show notes, so please check it out. And uh, I'll be right back to close out the show in just a moment. And there you have it, folks. That is episode one of the Dark Parade in the books. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. We really had a great time. And, of course, he will be back to talk uh, Psycho 2, um, which probably less thematic talk and talk of, uh, you know, <laughs> the director being a master. But uh, I'm very excited to have that conversation, and I, I really look forward to uh, having Jerry back on the show. Uh, I think he's terrific. So, um, look, here's the point where I, I shamelessly grovel. This is, of course, a brand new show. So please, 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 if you would... Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard, uh, go to uh, iTunes or whatever the podcatcher of your choice is. Please leave a rating and review for the show. Share the show where you can. Um, like This is real ground up kind of stuff for me. So um, uh, there's no, <laughs> unfortunately, no way to just port listeners over from one show to another or anything. So spread the word if you would, and I would really appreciate it. And also... Uh, please, uh, you know, be part of this. This is one of the goals I had for this show is to make it much more community focused and, and listener focused. And so I think I know what the next series is going to be. But if you have suggestions, uh, drop me a line. You can do that um, on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, there's an Instagram also at the same uh, Dark Parade Pod moniker. Uh, you can reach me via the email at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Um, and also, the Facebook group uh, has been really interactive, and that's something that I've been uh, very proud of. So if you just go to facebook.com, uh, I think it's forward slash groups, forward slash dark parade is how that reads. Uh, but uh, search for the dark parade on Facebook, and that'll, that'll get you to our Facebook group. And not only have I been posting stuff about the show, but, uh, you know, tis the season, it's Halloween, so I've been posting a lot of the decorations that we've been working on, and that sort of thing, so that's been a lot of fun as well. And I hope, uh, like I said, you come back for more, there will be a new Morbid Monday next Monday, also there's going to be a bonus episode, uh, a little bonus show that we are calling uh, The Heart of Horror with myself and Kate Pollock. Uh, that'll be appearing on the feed pretty soon where we look at horror movies and talk about relationships and stuff as well. Uh, so that is something that I hope you enjoy. And that's it for now. Uh, thanks again for listening. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for liking, subscribing, all that stuff that you do these days with uh, with social media. But uh, like I said, it's I, I'm so excited to do this show. And uh, I want...